Get this audiobook for free today at theaudiobook.co.uk. It is not for me to be so cavalier with the lives of others, however. In much of my life, from 1977 to 1987, people appear who are known in the public world and to whom I cannot give convincing pseudonyms. If I told you, for example, that at university I met a man called Liu Horry and that we embarked on a comic career together, it might not take great insight or too much googling on your part to know that I was writing about a real person. It's not for me to go blabbing about his life and loves, personal habits, mannerisms and modes of behaviour, is it? On the other hand, were I simply to say that everyone I met in my journey through life was darling and gorgeous and super and lovely and talented and dazzling and sweet, you would soon enough be arcing streams of hot vomit all over the place and in every probability short-circuiting your e-book reader. I don't doubt for a minute that my publishers have already made it clear in the small print of the contract I signed with them that I, the author, am responsible for all lawsuits appertaining to, but not restricted to, emetic and bodily fluid damage to electronic reading devices in this and all territories. So I am sailing between the scylla of protecting the wholly reasonable privacy of friends and colleagues and the charybdis of causing you, the reader, to sick up. It is a narrow course, and I shall do my best to steer it safely. These pages deal with some of the sea-words that have dominated my life. Before the chronology of the chronicles commences, let me catalogue a couple more seas, to put you, as it were, in the mood. C is for C12 H22 O11. For cereal. For candy. For caries. For cavities. For carbohydrates. For calories. Shades of the prison house begin to close upon the growing boy. William Wordsworth, Intimations of Mortality. To care about my body would be to suggest that I had a body worth caring about. Since my earliest years, I felt nothing but shame for the useless casing of flesh I inhabit. It couldn't bowl, bat, or catch, it couldn't dance. It couldn't ski, dive, or leap. When it walked into a bar or club, it didn't attract lustful glares of desire or even faint glances of interest. It had nothing to recommend it beyond its function as a fuel cell for my brain and a dumping ground for toxins that might reward me with rushing highs and reasons to be cheerful. Perhaps it all comes down to breasts, or the lack of them. While it is true that I was once a babe, I was never, I think, a suckling. I have no memories of being clamped to the nipple, and believe myself to have been bottle-fed from the beginning. There are psychologists, schooled in this tradition or that, whether Kleinian, Freudian, Adlerian, Jungian, or insert name Herian, I cannot say, who hold that the tit or teat issue has a significant, even crucial, bearing on human development. I can't recall whether the theory suggests it is the denial of mother's milk or the overabundant supply of it that stores up problems for later life, possibly both. A lot of bosom pressed into your face at a tender age, and you could grow up with a Russ Meyer or Jonathan Ross breast fixation. Nothing but bottle to suck, and you develop a horror of bosoms, or a propensity towards drink in general, or perhaps the other way around. All absolute poppywash, of course false mammary syndrome. There are plenty of brothers and sisters, identical twins even, fed on the same infant diets who have turned out different in every particular, except the irrelevant one of physical appearance. My brother and sister were treated just as I was in infancy, and we could not be, fortunately for them and the world, less alike. So let us suppose that the vices and weaknesses that I am going to tell you about now are peculiar to me and were bestowed upon me at birth, along with the moles on the back of my legs and the walls on the pads of my fingers. Which is not to say that I am uniquely alone in the possession of these weaknesses. Far from it. They might almost be called the failings of my generation. Once we get beyond milk, whether breast or formula, we move on to the hard stuff. Solid food. Pappy spoonfuls of apple sauce and beef casserole are pushed into us until we can wield cutlery for ourselves. One of the first and most forcible ways in which a child's character begins to express itself is through its attitude to food. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, food meant breakfast cereal and sweets. 
I was one of the first wave of infants to be exposed to child targets.